Welcome to Micro Front Ends for Java Microservices. I've had to cancel probably four or five meetings that I was supposed to attend to today because, you know, we're like seven hours behind where I live. So I do have to take a selfie with you all to prove to my boss that I actually, you know, was speaking at a conference. So let's start with that. Oh, and what I want you to celebrate is not me or this talk. It's my son's last day of high school today. So he's graduating. So put your hands up and be like, yay, Jack. Ready? One, two, three. Yay, Jack. <laughs> All right. So welcome. My name is Matt Rabel. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity, no running water, and had to walk two miles to the bus stop every day. But in the winter, we got to ski. So I have like 10,000 hours of Nordic skiing in, and I never really knew that until you know I got to the age of 35 or 40 and was like, wow, this Nordic skiing is really fun, and I'm really good at it, right? So there's cool things that can happen when you're in the backwoods of Montana as a kid. I live in Denver, Colorado with my beautiful wife, Trish, awesome kids, Abby and Jack. Jack is there on the left, and like I said, he's graduated from high school today, so he's now six feet, and uh, that picture was only taken a few years ago. So if you have kids that are like, 14, 15, around that age, get ready for a sprout, right? They grow a lot in those next couple years. I also have a middle child. His name is Hefe. I bought him off eBay in 2004, and it took me 12 years to make him look like this. Part of the problem was we put a Porsche engine, Porsche transmission in him, so he's got 250 horsepower, super fun to drive. If you have a similar obsession with old classic Volkswagens, I'd love to talk to you after because it's obviously an expensive problem of mine. I work for a company called Okta. My dad, for the first few years, called it Okra, right? He's now graduated to Okta, so he's almost there, but Okta, Okta is kind of a cool like, term. It means a unit of cloud measurement. So if it's an eight Okta day, it means you're not seeing the sun at all, it's all cloudy. If it's zero Oktas, it means you know the sun's out, it's a nice day. So two years ago, we bought a company called Auth0. And one of the things I noticed about the CEO of Auth0, Eugenio Pace, was his profile. In his profile, he said he liked to you know, spend time outdoors, rowing, riding bikes, spending time with his family, and restoring his 1970 Carmen Ghia, which is also another classic Volkswagen, right? So I was like, I'm going to get along with this guy. So um, yeah, today we're going to talk about a brief history of microservices, microservices with Java, and then microservices with Jay Hipster, an introduction to micro front ends. I'll go into a live demo, and then I'll talk a bit about OAuth 2.1, and then you know give you some steps for where to go from here. So it all started way back in 2007. That was the first mention of microservices. It was at a uh, Java conference, uh, or actually a Microsoft conference, and uh, and basically it was one or two words at that point, right? But what really like, brought it into the limelight was, uh, was Martin Fowler and James Lewis's article about microservices. Martin Fowler is there up on the right. James Lewis is on the left. There's also Adrian Cockroft and Joe Walm. So these guys are often credited with being some of the pioneers that really brought it to the masses. Uh, Adrian was at Netflix at the time, and he described the architecture as fine grain SOA. And I think you know anyone that's been in this industry for a while might see some similarities between SOA and microservices, and he pioneered the style at scale, as did Joe Walms. And uh, that article simply titled Microservices came out on March 25th, 2014. And years later, this is still considered the definitive article that defines microservices. So remember that date, March 25th, 2014, because it'll come into play later. So as part of that article, they mentioned Conway's Law which is any organization that designs a system, defined broadly, will produce a system whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So if you have a team of UI specialists, today we call them front-end developers, right? And middleware specialists might be Java developers, and then DBAs, and you organize your teams like that, chances are those teams are gonna optimize to get what they can get done within their team. So for DBAs, this might be more stored procedures and less you know, logic in the, in the middle tier. But the middle tier might do more stuff that could have been done in the database right, in their section. And basically, you know, a smart team optimizes around this and chooses the lesser of two evils. They you know, force the logic into what app, whatever tier they're building rather than working with the other team. So you know, microservices is very much 
you have to structure your teams so they can do it all, all the way from coming up with the ideas to putting in a production. So if you currently work in an organization, you're thinking about adopting microservices, and you do it this way with front end and middle tier and back end, it's just not going to work, or it's going to be painful, right? So the philosophy of microservices is do th one thing and do it well. It's based on like the Unix concepts, and it's basically you know the ability to do one thing and communicate with another thing makes it very easy to deploy. But what I learned at my time at LinkedIn, this is you know 15 years ago or whatever, was they really had a hard time not scaling the monolith that they had built because it was scaling fine in 2008, 2009, but the people. Right? When they added new people to the team, it slowed things down. So they needed a way to break it apart so they could get more engineers working on it. And that's where microservices come into play. A lot of times is you know, a company has a thousand developers working on the same project. If that's a monolith, there's going to be PR conflicts all the time. right? But if they split it up and have teams that can execute all the way from ideation to production, then it's going to be much faster. So Java is a great language when developing a microservices architecture. In fact, some of the biggest names in the industry use it. If you've heard of Netflix, you know, Amazon, Google, eBay, Twitter, or LinkedIn, right? They're all in there. And you know, major companies are doing incredible traffic with Java. So you know, implementing microservices architecture isn't for everyone. And for the most part, you shouldn't do it. And even Martin says it in his article. He's like, start with a monolith, maybe do some asynchronous messaging in there, you know, so you're not type coupling your code together, but for the most part, start with a monolith, break it up later, and just design your systems so they can handle that. So the Java ecosystem has some of the best patterns for developing microservice architectures. If you're familiar with Spring, you'll feel right at home developing with Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. And so this is why I mentioned dates, because obviously October 2002 was pretty cool. Rod Johnson wrote the J2E Design and Development book. I actually got to hang out with Rod in San Francisco last weekend. He's still alive and well, doing great. Um, Spring 1.0 came out in 2004. 2006, it got better right, with XSDs and uh, XML schemas. And then Java Config came out in 2009. But around that same time, a lot of us were still using Spring, but using it in a way that was referred to as XML health. Right? Because there was so much XML. So even though you could use Java config, no one was really using it. Right? And so Spring kind of got a bad name. And at the same time, it was the stagnation of Java 8 was happening. Right? And so us in the Java community was like, well, there's not a lot new going on. And then Node comes out right around that time too. Right? And there were some people that defected and went over there and started writing Node applications. But it wasn't until 2014, I feel like, like the renaissance happened again. And that was Spring Boot 1.0 released on April Fool's Day. Remember March 25th, 2014, microservices article? The next week is when Spring Boot came out. And then a year later was Spring Cloud 1.0. And Spring Cloud like, took a lot of the Netflix libraries that they were using to scale their microservices and made them publicly available right, with Spring integration. So there's a strong correlation there, I think, in the Java community between microservices and you know, the boom of them. And probably a lot of you know about Spring Boot. How many people are using it? So I would say that's 80 or 90 percent. Um, so I'm not going to talk much about it. But you know, one of the things that it really did well was it made uh, default, right? Convention over configuration, a whole new ballgame. Like they had done a little bit of it before, but not like Ruby on Rails, right? And Ruby on Rails was 10 years old at this time. So they figured out a way to use conditionals and just configure things automatically when they're on the class path. And then they took the drop wizard concept of embedding your app server in your app and made that very popular, right? We don't deploy it to Tomcat anymore. We just put Tomcat in our app, and it works great. And so Spring Framework 5.0 was released way back in 2017. And it builds on Reactor and the Reactive Stream specification, and it includes Spring WebFlux. So Spring Boot 2.0 added WebFlux support and was released in March 1, 2018. And that's pretty impressive that 2018, and now we're 2023, they had five years on a single major version before they released Spring Boot 3.0, right? And that was last November. So uh, I really enjoy using Spring because it always works. It's always backwards compatible, right? And you don't have to worry about upgrading to the new latest release. It's not that difficult. So people often ask, 
when would you use Spring Web Flux versus Spring MVC? And I often say that performance differences are negligible, and this is not me saying it, I actually read it from one of the Spring guys. Uh, you are doing, if you're doing a lot of API calls at the tune of 500 requests per second, then WebFlux will probably save you money. And by save you money, it's because of the reactive way of doing things that it will use less hardware resources. So if your cloud bill is you know, a million dollars a month, maybe you get it down to 800,000, right? So you know, it's a way of optimizing for scale. And if you don't need that, I wouldn't recommend using it, right? I would use regular old Spring MVC. And a lot of the reason is because if you look at this code, it's pretty simple to understand, right? We're getting a new points object here, and if it you know, doesn't have an ID, we're rejecting it, and we're saving it, we're updating an Elasticsearch repository, and then we're returning you know, JSON to the client that says you know, it succeeded, and here's the entity with its ID. If you do the same thing, in Spring Web Flux, it's almost twice as much code, right? And you kind of have to learn about the Java Streams API, and you have to like flat map and map and all that kind of stuff to get everything working. So it's a little bit of a paradigm shift for a Java developer to learn, right? So the learning curve's a little steep, but you get that performance. So, you know, there's a trade off. So, why we're all about reactive Java microservices with JHipster back in, you can see, 2021 there. And it was one of my most popular blog posts that I've ever published on the Okta Developer Blog. Um, so if you want to learn more about like just microservices and reactive stuff, go ahead and read that. And you might be wondering now, like, what is JHipster? So JHipster started as a project before Spring Boot even came out. And it was Spring MVC on the back end, and it generated Angular JS on the front end. So it started out as just an application generator. And a lot of Java developers liked it because they're like, what's this AngularJS thing? Like, how do I use that? And they were able to you know, generate an app with it and kind of see how it worked. And so I like to view it as like a choose your own adventure book, but as a tool. So as I said, it started as an application generator, but nowadays it has support for generating like GitHub Actions or Jenkins, right, to do CI, CD, as well as like Kubernetes deployment descriptors and Docker Compose files to run everything. And so we still call it an application generator, but there's people on the team that like to call it a development platform, right? But we're all volunteers, right? We have no company behind us, so you know, we're not great at marketing, but we're pretty good. So it's a thriving OSS project. It's starred by Julien Dubois out of Paris on October 21st, 2013, and his first commit was hipster stack for Java developers, Yeoman, which was tool at the time that you used to generate you know, apps, and we still have it embedded in there, Maven, Spring, and AngularJS in one handy generator. So it's grown quite a bit since then, right? It's you know, now 10 years. We're having our 10-year anniversary here in October. And we had 2 million downloads in 2020, and then 1.8 in 2021. And we're averaging 120,000 downloads a month. So a lot of people are using it, or there's a bunch of CI servers out there like generating apps with it, one of the two, right? So. Um, to use it, you would install jhipster first. And when Julian originally created the project, he actually, the whole idea was that generating it, you might require Node. But after that, you as a Java developer don't even need Node on your machine. And so that was the whole purpose that they originally did it for, was to allow like the Node type of tooling to happen from Maven. So here's the steps. If you're not familiar with the take command, it just does make dir and cds into it. It's built into like oh my zsh. You could also write a function that does it, but it's pretty handy. And then you run jhipster, and then it prompts you for all kinds of options. I know it's a bit difficult to read on the right there, so I'll read some of them. But basically, do you want to create a monolith, a gateway, or a microservice? So if you're caught in the hubbub now between do we do microservices or do we do a monolith, the cool thing is if you archetype your entities or whatever, in JDL, you can choose and generate a new project that's a monolith and test it against the gateway project and the microservices, right? So you can kind of look at both types of architectures. It uh, allows you to use Spring MVC or WebFlex, um, allows you to choose the authentication type. So if you're doing a monolith, you can use like session based authentication. If you're doing microservices, it only supports OAuth 2 and JWT based authentication. Database type, it'll do SQL or NoSQL. If you choose SQL with uh, Spring WebFlex, it'll give you R2DBC, right? So it's a little more code because 
you're like using JDBC template ish, right? They do have some repositories in there for Spring, spring Data, but it's not uh, it's not as simple as JPA. Uh, it allows you to choose between Gradle or Maven, and then the web framework. You can choose React, Angular, or Vue. And you can also use jhipster online. So similar to start.spring.o, we have start.jhipster.tech. Uh, the reason we allow you to sign in is so you can save like your JDL files for your different apps. And then we can push it to like GitHub, GitLab, or GitHub. Or you can just download the project and run it locally. So in this case, you wouldn't even need Node at all, right? You could create your project that way and go from there. And so JDL stands for jhipster domain language. That's how we know we're hip. Right? We have our own domain language. And it basically allows you to you know, define your different applications. So in this case, we have a gateway application up here. We say reactive is true. And truth be told, for gateways, it can only be reactive. So if you say reactive equals false, we're going to ignore that. Because Spring Cloud Gateway only supports Spring WebFlex at this time. There is an issue out there to support Spring MVC, but they're not doing it yet. So we had to do that struggle, I think, when it was upgrading to uh, Spring Boot 2.7 or something like that, or Spring Cloud, a new version of Spring Cloud, because we were using Zool, right? And it was Spring Cloud Netflix Zool, and it's similar to Spring Cloud Gateway. Uh, but when we upgraded to the new version, it wasn't available anymore. And the Spring team said, well, Netflix Zool 2.0 is reactive, but we're going to build our own. And so that's where Spring Cloud Gateway came from. And then down here in the application, we have a blog. Right? It specifies the authentication type, the build tool, the database type. And you know the authentication type has to be the same, obviously, between all your microservices or things aren't going to work. Like I do believe it'll let you generate different ones, but it's going to break. Right? But databases, you can have different databases for each application, because obviously you know, they're not coupled at the database level. So another important part of microservices and their architectures are Docker and Kubernetes. And jhipster also uses console and Eureka for service discovery. So you have the choice. And in the next version of jhipster, jhipster 8, we will default to console. And a lot of the reason for that is Eureka hasn't been maintained. Like it still works, right? Spring Boot has support for it. And it's out there. But it just doesn't get a lot of contributions, whereas console from HashiCorp is getting a lot of contributions. And I mentioned CI and CD, right? If you type jhipster CI CD, it'll prompt you for if you want to do GitHub Actions, or we probably still have Travis support in there, right? And Jenkins, that's one of the most popular ones. So I mentioned that post earlier about reactive Java microservices with jhipster. And one of the things it does is it generates this. Right? You have your Git repo over here with your jhipster registry. You have your gateway, and that's where your Angular app sits. And then your microservices are in the background. Well, part of the problem with this is the whole UI sits on the gateway. And so that creates a tight coupling between the UI on the gateway and its microservices that it's a UI for. So I'd been doing you know, talks about jhipster for years, and I didn't really realize I kind of realized the architecture flaw, but I really didn't realize a solution for it. And so the architecture flaw is, right, you, you modify some of your backend microservices, and that requires a tweak for the UI. Well, if you tweak the UI and the gateway, now you have to deploy both of them. right? And that's kind of like, well, that violates the whole principle of microservices, where everything's supposed to be independently deployable. So now you can solve this problem with micro front ends. And how this works is the gateway just has like an app shell. And it's responsible for loading the UIs from the microservices. So the cool thing is the microservices themselves contain the back end code, but they also contain the front end code. Right? And the cool thing is you can actually develop that microservice without the other stuff running. Right? And so you can just isolate it down to what you're working on there. So Webpack's module federation is one of the best known implementations for micro front ends, and that's what we use in jhipster. And so similar to microservices, that article from Martin Fowler, there was a micro front ends article published, right? Two words. And uh, I always go back and forth whether it should be one word, two words, or hyphenated, right? And there's really no good answer for that. A lot of people have differing opinions. So I use what he uses with the space in there. And basically, ThoughtWorks Radar, right? So this came out June 2019. So it's been you know, four years now, almost four years. 
Uh, in November 2016, ThoughtWorks Radar said, assess micro front ends. November 2017, a year later, trial them. April 2019, you know, a couple years later, they said adopt, and November 2019 still in adopt. And I haven't seen it recently, so I think that just means they're not saying, you know, stop using it, and they're not saying adopt it because it's not a new technology anymore. So the key benefits witnessed by ThoughtWorks when they actually, you know, did this study and wrote this research was smaller, more cohesive, and maintainable code bases, more scalable organizations with decoupled autonomous teams, and the ability to upgrade, update, or even rewrite parts of the front end in a more incremental fashion than previously possible. So I think a lot of this is actually caused by AngularJS because it was so widely popular in like early 2010 all the way up to 2014, and then better browsers and better frameworks came along, and people are like, how do we get off AngularJS? So with micro front ends, you can just take a page or a part of a page or whatever and replace that with React, for instance, if people are you know, migrating. So it's not just module federation. Uh, Zach Jackson is the creator of module federation and recently collaborated with Manfred Steyer to create native federation. So this means you can use micro front ends with any build tool, not just Webpack. So there's like ES build, there's Rollup, there's a few other ones out there. So it allows you to be more flexible in your build tool. And so you might be asking, I'm a Java developer, why should I care? And I think from an architectural standpoint, it's a fascinating concept, right? The fact that, you know, with microservices, like a lot of times what I think happened with JHipster is people didn't have a UI. So they never cared, right? They're developing a microservices architecture with JHipster and kind of scaffolding it, but then they custom build it and the UI is like someone else's problem, right? It's like that microservices organization problem that probably happened at some companies. So, you know, with micro front ends, it's all HTTP and you can see your app like getting stitched together as it loads. Like if you look at your browser's network console and, you know, you see the remote modules load. And I've encountered quite a few monolithic UIs in my time as a consultant. I was a consultant for 20 years before I worked at Okta. And the back end was always like a beautiful microservice, right? It was well done, well tested, and it was all tightly coupled on the front end. And so there's a good chance that many Java developers here don't care about the UI because you just work on the beautiful back ends, right? However, if you consider yourself a Java web developer, I think micro front ends can be as revolutionary as HTML5. Like it's a cool thing that's happened. It's a better way to architect your microservices if you have UIs that are associated with them. And so what I'd like to show you today is using JHipster, how to create apps with the JDL, then we'll run apps and E2E tests. We'll run everything in Docker, and then JHipster ships with Keycloak for OAuth by default. I'll show you how easy it is to switch to another identity provider. So one of the sweet things about Spring Security, we use Spring Security throughout, they make it possible to switch from one OAuth provider to another by changing three properties, an issuer, a client ID, and a client secret. So that's the power of Spring Security that you could you know, switch from one to another. So first thing I probably need to do is mirror my screen so I'm not talking and you're not seeing anything, right? That's the worst. So we'll mirror there. And then we might need to bump the fonts. Let me open the repo here or the demo script. And then we'll make it a bit bigger because that's a little hard to see. Displays. We want to do that one, uh, 1280 by 720. That's a bit better, right? Might be harder for me, but it's easier for you, which is the important part. So this is a uh, doesn't like ASCII doctor there. Let's turn that off. So here's my demo script. And basically, we're going to just build a microservices and micro front ends architecture with JHipster. We we'll use Spring Cloud Gateway. We'll have a blog microservice, a store microservice, and each will have its own database. Probably not recommended, right? I'm just trying to be fancy, but I don't know why you would have a Postgres database for your gateway and a Mongo database for your store and a Neo4j database for your blog. That seems kind of weird, right? You probably don't have experts in all those, but you know, it's a demo. So the prerequisites are Java 11, but what I'm going to do today is I'm going to use a main branch of JHipster because it's been updated for Spring Boot 3, uses Spring Boot 3.05. Um, some things might break, but I should be able to handle them. 
uh, we're going to use node 18, not 16. So this is using the last public release of jhipster, which was 793. It was released last September. So if you use this script, like everything would work. But it's no fun to show technology that's six months old, right? We want to see the latest and greatest. So uh, we'll put this on the left here. And then we'll scroll down. And uh, the first thing is install jhipster. Well, I've already done that. But if you don't have it installed, npmi-g generator jhipster. And then take command to you know, create a new directory. And then basically, there's a couple files here. I'll just do this in my downloads directory. So I did have a problem with npm install, right? A lot of you probably have had that problem. Like Maven downloads the internet, right? npm downloads the internet and like invites all its friends. Like, let's party, right? And so I did do some stuff first so you didn't sit here for five minutes while the npm install is happening. So uh, there's uh, a reactive ms. JDL, that's for micro front ends. And then there's a reactive MF, JDL. Um, so the reactive MS was the microservices one before we had like micro front end support. And the micro front ends, you know, is a bit different. And I wanted to show you the difference. So if you have IntelliJ installed, you can install a command line idea tool that's pretty cool. So this is the difference between you know, old and new. On the left here, we have just microservices. On the right, we have micro front ends. So I could have used Vue, but I just chose React. And then service discovery type is console, because that's what we're going to use in the next one. And the micro front ends is defined right here. Right? It used to be that you would specify the entities on the gateway, and that builds the UI for the gateway. So that's one difference. Um, also, we simplified this, because you know, not very dry if you're saying the same thing three times. So now you just have to say the database type, and then Eureka, and console. And then since we have a UI on those microservices, we can actually test them with Cypress and do end-to-end -end tests. So that's why I added it there. And then down here, it's more of the same. And then this is a new thing. Uh, the user is a built-in entity. It exists by default. So now we make you specify that, just so you know. And then uh, I added Kubernetes to this one. But also, there's some additional changes. So let me copy that one in here. Uh, desktop, uh, reactive for eight. And idea, I think there's changes. Maybe not. We'll see. V8 there. Mm, nope. So it's already been committed on that JDL sample. So. Um, in this MFR directory, let me close that. Um, this is what I created beforehand. So you can see it only took 10 seconds, right? Not so bad. But basically up here at the top, I ran the date. And you can see it was about an hour and a half ago. So I did do it at the conference, right? And I ran jhipster JDL. I talked to that one on my desktop. And the dash dash workspace is an NPM thing. So if you've worked with NPM, you've worked with Maven, right? You have aggregator palms that kind of make it so you can run commands at the top level, and it'll go through all your child projects. Well, this is similar. So you can run commands at the top level to you know, do every command for every app. So that can be handy. This model repository is mostly for demos. It basically just means don't check each project into its own GitHub repo. Um, and it doesn't really you know, do a GitHub repo thing. It just does git init. Right? And if you specify this model repository, it says, hey, I'm going to put all these in the same repo. Might not be a great idea. Right? But to start, if you've already had a monolith, you're migrating microservices, it might be a simple way. Uh, this skip jhipster dependencies is only necessary um, because we're using the main branch instead of a released version. So that took that. And then over here was this one. No, nope, close that one out. I had another window where I basically built the, uh, the front end, the gateway. And the reason for that is I didn't want to make you wait you know, four minutes and 54 seconds while an npm install happened. So let me go back to my instructions, make sure I'm following them. I also want to mention there's a jhipster JDL plugin. So the JDL, right, I showed it to you. It's got application. It's got all those databases and stuff in there. Uh, a guy from JetBrains created a JDL plugin. So if you open it up in JetBrains you, or in IntelliJ, you can get code completion and all that. So we generated that. You could also override it and use Angular Review if you wanted. And so now we'll run everything. First of all, let's make sure we don't have anything running. I have a bunch running, so let's stop all those Docker containers, just so you can see it from scratch. 
And then I have some shortcuts to basically start different containers with Docker Compose. So JH key code up is one of them. If you're using oh my ZSH, we have an oh my ZSH plugin, so you could you know, have all these as well. So if I did alias JH, you can see there's a whole bunch of them. Um, I also need to start console. So JH console up. And now if we do a Docker PS, both of those should be running. And now we can start up our gateway. And the reason I'm doing this is kind of show you, you know, how things are working when we just start up the gateway and we don't have our backends running. Normally, in the monolithic UI case, what would happen is the front end would actually load, right? But when you tried to actually click on the menu items to go to the back end, like it would still load the front end, but in your console there would be like 404 errors, right? Because it didn't find it. So if we load this up, 8080, and log in with Keycloak. And we go to the entities, they aren't there, right? There's blog entities and there's product entities for the store, and it just simply doesn't load them. And if you looked, you know, in the console, you would see, you know, hey, there's some issues, you know, connecting to those endpoints, 404, right? So the cool thing is this app is functioning. It just doesn't load the things that aren't loading. So if we were to go to the blog app, and first of all, we need to start its database. So it's using Neo4j, and then we could start that up with Gradle. And then while that's going, I'll actually open up the project. Not jhipster. We had it at downloads and MFR. I kind of like the name MFR because it's my initials, right? Matt Fitzrabel. My dad actually wanted to change my last name to Fitzrabel, so I had no association with the family, right? It's a whole new family. He was really mad at his dad, but they didn't do it, so. So let's see if that's going. It's still doing Webpack, but it did finish compiling. I do think it's funny that nowadays, you know, I spend more time waiting for TypeScript to compile than Java, right? It used to be like Java is slow to compile, and now it's wicked fast, and it just works great. So that all starts up, and then we could go to uh, our browser here and refresh, right? That still has those unloading. We refresh, and now those backend services for the blog are loading, right? We could create a new one that's you know, Matt's blog, Mrable, and then assign it to the admin. And that's all working. Um, and same thing with the store, right? We could go to the store directory, and JH uh, Mongo is what it uses. And then start that one up. And just to show you how the micro front ends is working, under gateway and source main, uh, no, it's actually under webpack, so scratch that. Uh, webpack front ends. Make this a little bigger. You can see that there's two remotes, right? One for the blog and one for the store. And then there's a bunch of shared stuff, right? So these are you know, menu components, menu items that are kind of pulled in from the micro front ends and used to build their UIs. And then if I were to look at the blog and look at its configuration, you'll see that it's exporting, right? It's exporting is that module federation plugin to export the blog endpoint with remote entry, and then these menu items, if we were to go to those, you can see what it's sucking in there for the entity menu. It's pulling in app, uh, web app, app, entities menu. And you can see here it's got those entities, right? The blog, the tags, the posts, and all that. So that's just getting sucked in, as well as the routes, right? Those are getting sucked in as well by, or exposed, I should say, rather than sucked in um, the entity routes and all that. And then it pulls in those shared components as well. So now if we were to go back to our app, the store is up and running, and we refresh that. Oh, not yet. Well, one of the things you can do is you can look at console, right? What's console say? 8500. It says the store hasn't quite started yet. Looks like it has. Try one more time. There we are. So then we could create a new product. I like beer. Why do y'all like warm beer? I like cold beer. But I know in England they like warm stuff. I only learned that in Ireland when I had a, a you know conversation with some guys in a pub, and they were from you know, uh, you know, uh, England. We were in Ireland, 
Um, but it was Belfast, right? It's Northern Ireland, so it's England. And uh, and we were comparing, right? I was like, I like cold Guinness. They're like, no, this warm cask beer is so much better. But we never agreed. So um, tonight we'll have some good beer at the Dever Ox party, right? So that's all working. And then we can go here and see what our next steps are. Uh, oh, I wanted to show you how you can do zero turnaround, how you can just work on a microservice and see you know, things happen quickly. So in the Gateway app, we'll do this in IntelliJ. Let's go into Gateway here, and we'll do npm start. So this is just running the front end, and it's proxying the request to the back end, right? So it's running on port 9000 here. And uh, if we were to look at my instructions, basically says, you know, make a quick edit to home.tsx, add this class name. So if we go to home.tsx in the Gateway project, you know, we're modifying our React here. And we're going down here. and I think adding something right here, or uh, I'm a quick edit. Grab the whole thing. Oh, why'd you do that? Quick edit. There we go. So put that in our code. And now you go back here, and it's already refreshed, right? I wasn't fast enough. So it shows you, you know, if you make changes in the UI, they're available right away. So I'm going to remove that and then show what happens in the blog microservice. So if we go into the, well, the store, let's start with the store. So down here, we go into store, and we do npm start. The fun thing here is it's actually just firing up the store. So if you look at the entities, it's just product in there, right? It's just the UI for the store. But it's sucking in, like, the, uh, the shared stuff from the main gateway, right? It's pulling in that, uh, the menu bar, the page, and all that. And so now what we can do is we could go into here and we'll edit this and show you that it's zero turnaround too so product.tsx and then if we scroll down here and do something like find the first div i think i had my class over here that i defined give it a background info so just got to look for a div div there we go add that go back and it's changed that as well. So the cool thing is you can operate on all these UIs for the microservices, and they're all you know, working nicely. Back to our instructions, or what? Come on. So that's how you make everything you know, work that way. And then we'll build them all in Docker. So how many people have a newer MacBook where you got the M1 or the M2? Pretty slick, right? But it also causes all kinds of problems if you're creating like Docker containers locally because you have to pass in different flags or the Docker container runs you know, pretty slowly. So let's exit out of all these. And we're going to do uh, Docker stop or D stop is my command for it to stop all those Docker containers. And then we'll build you know, all of these as Docker containers. Because we used NPM workspaces, we can actually run this from the top level. So if we do npm run, it'll show the optional tasks. And if we look for Docker, well, there's Java Docker, which will build it with jib. But because I'm on an M1, we had to have another task for ARM64. If you're deploying to Docker Hub and then pulling it in with Kubernetes and running it in Google Cloud, like obviously you don't want to build your images as ARM64 images, right? So this is just useful if you're doing it locally. So I'll run that. Well, actually, I don't want to do it there. I want to do it from the top level. So it does all of them. So like I said, this is similar to the aggregator POM in Maven. It's just running this command on all the child projects. Choosing Gradle to do it. And uh, you know everything's already been compiled, so it shouldn't have to do any NPM install or anything like that. And while that's going, I also wanted to show you that you know, in all these projects, it is using Spring Webflux, because we did do reactive equals true at the beginning. So just to show you that code, like if we were to look at you know, in here, our REST endpoint, product resource, you can see, first of all, it doesn't like that I haven't set that up. You know, it's got that saving and mapping and all that kind of stuff in there. So if nothing else, JHipster can be a great way to see how to do, like, reactive programming with Spring Webflux, right? You can generate an app and just look at the code. The cool thing is there's, like, 80% coverage testing-wise both on the front end and the back end. So you can not only see how you do a product resource, right? you can see how to test that product resource. 
So it looks like everything's good to go there. We'll CD into Docker Compose and do Docker Compose up. And if you did, you know, dash D, hmm, didn't like that. I might be the, using the wrong one. 8600's already in use. So let's stop that. And then there's Docker dash compose and Docker space compose, right? The Docker space compose is the new one. Let's just make sure nothing's running first. Docker compose up. And if you did dash D, then it runs the daemon, but you couldn't see all these pretty colors and everything, you know, starting at the same time. So it's kind of fun to see what's going on. You know, it's starting up console, it's starting up Keycloak. It knows the order that it should start things in. It knows that the app depends on Postgres and all that. And, you know, while that's going, you can open up a browser. You can go to console, refresh 8500, and see, you know, not everything's up there yet. The store is coming in. The other th stuff is coming in. Um, but they're not quite live, and as they start to get live, you kind of see, you know, that changing. So now you can go to localhost 8080, prove that you can log in, and you'll notice in my browser bar, it says Keycloak. So we haven't figured out a solution for this. You have to put Keycloak as Etsy host 127001, right, because it is redirecting to the client, and it's kind of how OAuth works versus a lot of times when you're doing Docker containers like they talk to each other in the back end, right? They aren't doing any front end communication. So you can see all that stuff's working. And then what I want to do is just change to using a different identity provider. I'm just going to change it to use Auth0. So if we go into Docker Compose here, this is how we can configure the whole set of microservices, right? We can specify properties in here, and it'll distribute it using console to everyone else. So I have on my desktop, I already have the file, so desktop application pb copy, and I can go here, put it in here, and basically we have an audience because we do audience validation, we have an issuer, client ID, and client secret. And you can see I have GitHub Copilot installed, it's like you need a scope as well. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to press enter. But it would work if I did. So then we can stop all this, as long as that's saved. and then restart it, and usually this is pretty quick. It helps that a lot of these images are built for ARM64, um, because then it really optimizes everything and they, they start quickly. So then we can go back to console. We got one. We got two, three. All right, and I'll do this in an incognito window because you know, you never know if there's any tokens stuck in my browser. And then if I do sign in, it redirects me to Auth0. Anyone using 1Password? Or some sort of password manager? Because my parents use 1Password as well, but it's not the same 1Password that I use. Uh, the cool thing in 1Password 8 is there's shift command spacebar. We'll open it up. And then you can, I already have Auth0 here. Uh, shift command C will copy the password. And so you never really need to open the app to copy your passwords out. So that's pretty slick. And now I'm logged in, you know, with an Auth0 account and everything here will still work. You know, Auth0 is cool. Handle is uh, A0 and we'll assign it to my Emrable account. So everything's working, right? Even in Docker, back to my instructions, make sure I didn't miss anything. I think that was the gist of it. I don't know what's going on here. I'm going to have to start using Firefox if that keeps up. Um, and I didn't show you how to set this up on Auth0 to get everything, but here's the instructions in this demo script. You basically create a new app. You have this as a callback URL. The reason we use OIDC instead of like Auth0 or Okta there is because we like to be generic, right? We like to switch to Keycloak and Okta and Auth0 and not have to change that callback URL. And then you set up some roles. You set up some users. This is how you add your group's information to your ID tokens. And then, uh, you know, you put your values in here after that. So back to the presentation. So OAuth 2.1 basically takes a lot of things out of microservices or out of uh, OAuth 2.0 and makes it a lot better. So let me, uh, you'll see my note there, put on glasses. I've done this presentation before where I dress as a J-hipster as I'm doing it. And I just, uh, I didn't bring the gear this time, so sorry. Next time I'll, I'll bring it. So improvements in OAuth 2.1 are 
Pixie is required if you do an authorization code flow. So Pixie is proof key for code exchange. And how it works is it basically generates a client secret on the fly. So if you have a JavaScript client, a spa, or a mobile app or whatever, and using a client secret in there to do OpenID Connect or do OAuth, you're doing it wrong. When I first started investigating adding OAuth to JHipster, it said it had OAuth support, and it used Spring Security's like UAA server to generate and do the OAuth like in the app. And then I found in the client side code a client secret. And I was like, whoa, I've only worked here at Okta for like a year, but I know that's bad. And so we went and refactored everything and, and made it so the IDP or the identity provider is external, right? Not built into the app. Um, redirect URIs must be exact strings. So Keycloak, I think we even support it, will allow you to do like asterisks in your redirect URIs. So it allows everything. In 2.1, they're going to take that away. Um, implicit grant. If you're doing spas and using implicit grant, stop. If you read a tutorial where they show you how to use resource owner password grant, where you send a username and password as part of your authentication, stop reading that tutorial. That's OAuth, but it's a terrible use of OAuth. The reason they have resource owner password grant is because Windows 3.1 couldn't pop a browser. And they want to make it so those legacy apps could use OAuth. Right? And so most modern operating systems can pop a browser. Um, there's some other stuff in there as well. But what I think you know, is interesting is I don't know that any IDPs are going to be like, we only support OAuth 2.1, unless they're brand new. Because a lot of times, they want all the customers. right? So you need this, I'll give you this. right? And so I don't know if it'll catch on. But you know, try to abide by it. Don't use these type of grants if you don't have to. Um, and you know, a lot of times, Use OAuth because you know, friends don't let friends write authentication, and it's a great way to do you know, microservices OAuth. So how it typically works is you know, back in the day with Yelp, you would put in your credentials, and then it would send all your Gmail contacts, right, your information. But now with OpenID Connect, you can connect with Google. You go to the authorization server. You come back from it, and you exchange your code for an ID and access token, and you can get the user's information from the user info endpoint. So it's been around since 2012. Don't use SAML if you can, because SAML was in 2005, right? We didn't even have smartphones or smart TVs since then. So it's really made things you know, work a lot better. And you know, I mentioned how JHipster had to move to Spring Cloud Gateway, right, instead of using Zool. So um, part of that was investigating. You know, I wrote a blog post like, how do I figure this out on my own without using you know, Zool? And so I wrote a post, and I wrote this diagram. And the reason I like to tell this story is I had someone from Volkswagen contact me on LinkedIn and say, how did you know our microservices architecture? And I'm like, that's pretty simple. I don't think that should qualify as a diagram that explains you know, your architecture. But it was funny. right? Um, with Spring Cloud Gateway, you can relay an access token down to your downstream microservices with just five lines of YAML. If you use properties, right, you can do it in one line. Um, but basically, there's a token relay filter that you can configure, and it'll make sure that communication happens. And then if you need identity information down in your microservice, you could either add claims to the access token so it has some identity information in there, or you can look it up at the user info endpoint. So with JHipster, it'll actually act as a resource server by default, either if you do a monolith or on the gateway. And we have support for doing like Ionic or React Native clients. And those will actually it detects if you have identity information in the access token, and if you don't, it'll go fetch it from the user info endpoint. So there's a lot of patterns in JHipster if you do an OAuth with microservices that you could just look at. I'm not trying to sell you JHipster. I'm just saying if you're doing microservices, you're doing OAuth. We've figured it out, and it's been pretty tried and true for the last five years. So I did publish a blog post on it that just shows reactive microservices with Spring Cloud Gateway. It's very simple. It just has that car service that returns different types of electric cars from Volkswagen. I'm very excited about the ID Buzz, right? That's coming out in the US next year, I think. And I hope to get one. Uh, this actual presentation and all its demos is from this blog post. So I start by writing the blog post. Then I do the presentation in the YouTube. There's a YouTube video in here as well that does the demo that we did today. And then, of course, the first one that kind of started it all. And also, I took that and showed how to deploy to Google Cloud. And the reason I thought that was important is if you saw my application.yaml in console, it had the raw values in there. 
the client ID and the client secret, right? That's not a good idea, especially if you check that into source control. So I used uh, cube, what was it? Uh, there's something from Bitnami, but it basically allows you to check in your source secrets and have them encrypted. So jhipster is also part of the dev community, dev.2 slash jhipster. We have lots of articles on deploying to different cloud providers. You might be asking, what about Kotlin? We actually have a Kotlin blueprint that allows you to make all the backend code in Kotlin. We also have blueprints for .NET Core, so if you want a .NET backend, it's available. Um, and like I said, React Native, Ionic, Nest.js as a backend, Micronaut as a backend, Quarkus as a backend, those all exist. And there's jhipster Lite if you don't want the CRUD stuff. And then we talked about all these things today. What's next? Spring Boot 3, right? jhipster 8, we're trying to get that out in the next month or two. There's Skim, which will allow you to sync users between the IDP and the app. And GraphQL is my personal interest. jhipster is knowledge. Generate it, look at it. Um, also Open Collective, you want to make some money. We have an estimated budget over 100 grand. I wrote a book on it. It's available from InfoQ. You can learn more here, and here, and here. And try jhipster. You can install it using that command. And all the source code for everything we generate today is here. And thank you. Keep in touch. Find me online at rabeldesigns.com. Find me on Twitter at mrabel. All my presentations are on speaker deck. This one's already up there. My code's on Octadev. And may the auth be with you.